Good evening. Uh, my name is John Giovanni, and I am the president of the Orange County chapter of the JDRF. And I'd like to thank you for joining us for our first adult type 1 series called Walking with T1D, or Walking with T1D Typo, Hypoglycemia Unawareness. Yeah. Oh, I can do that. What are you doing? <laughs> All I do is hit the uh, the arrows here. Okay. To the right is forward and left is back. I got that. I think I can handle that. In any event, if you'll notice the picture, I had hair. That was that was literally less than a year ago. So um, you know you can age quickly when you have surgery. <laughs> so, in any event, um, we created this program to fill a gap. You know, when my son, who's now 28, was diagnosed with T1D 18 years ago, my mother, God rest her soul, kept asking me, when will he grow out of this? She never came to the understanding that you don't grow out of this. And if anything, we have been remiss in not addressing adequately enough the needs of adult type 1s. And... Um, the problem is, or not the problem is, the reality of it is, is that approximately 50% of all people diagnosed uh, with T1D are adults when they're first diagnosed. And today, and this is kind of a, a blessing as well as a curse, uh, about 80% of all people with T1D are adults. And the reason I say it's kind of a blessing is because that means that the care of people with T1D has become significantly better than it used to be. Um, my grandfather was a insulin dependent type 2 diabetic and lived to 92. Uh, was diagnosed in his mid-30s and his treatment regimen was far different from what we have today. In any event though, um, you know, we have designed this program to, to address the needs of adults uh, with T1D. It is our hope to provide more opportunities of this sort and of a social nature uh, in the future. And we want to hear from all of you about what you would like us to address and what kind of uh, gatherings or informational meetings you'd like. And so when you came in, you were given a very brief half-page questionnaire, front and back, so we cheated a little bit. And we're going to ask you to fill that out at the end of the program and hand it in so we have some idea of what to do. Um, and with that, I'd like to extend some special thanks to our partners. First of all, the Mary and Dick Allen Diabetes Center. Um, slide. Okay. Uh, secondly, to our sponsors, Dexcom, thank you, Jason, and Omnipod, thank you, Matt. And to Chef Osmin and Sapphire Laguna for tonight's wonderful food. Okay. Let's have a round of applause. For the also, I'd like to extend special thanks to our adult type 1 volunteer leader, Susie Wan uh, Spicer. This event was her brainchild. And next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Marcus. Um, you know, to get us started here, Dr. Marcus specializes in the care of people with diabetes and endocrine disorders. He works with patients at his South Orange County Endocrinology Medical Office and at various clinics serving the community. He has dedicated his time to research and discovery of improved tools and methods for treating and diagnosing heart, kidney, and diabetes associated diseases. As Vice President and Global Director of Medical Affairs and Chief Medical Officer of Medtronic Diabetes from 2001 through 2009, he was instrumental in the development and obtaining regulatory approval of glucose sensors. He designed and directed a worldwide research program to make available innovative treatment tools that would radically improve the lives of patients with chronic diseases. After nine years at Medtronic, Dr. Marcus decided to devote his attention full-time to being a clinician. Tonight, he is here to remember Dr. Joseph Balaga, to whom this event is dedicated, who sadly lost his battle with T1D earlier this year. Dr. Marcus? Okay. 
thank you for um, recognizing Joe uh, as a human being, which is truly what he is and what we are and what this is all about. Um, just to give you a little background on Joe, um, I personally had the opportunity to know Joe for 14 years and to work together with him, but I actually knew him before that uh, when he was a medical student at the, the Ohio State University. And he was taken care of by a friend of mine, uh, Kwame Osai, who's the head of diabetes there. And followed him uh, throughout his uh, career after that. Kwame actually was the one who started uh, Joe on an insulin cup because he felt that was what was right for him at that time. Uh, Joe had been diagnosed with diabetes at age eight. But even before that, Joe, as a young man, age four, five, six, growing up in uh, western Pennsylvania, oh, took care of bunny rabbits and farmyard animals and his friends and his family, um, and he was always interested in caring for others. That was the focus of his life, was actually to care. Uh, it's a noble thing, but it's also something that you're blessed with, is the ability to reach out with your heart. Uh, Joe was diagnosed at age eight with type one diabetes and his family, his older sister and brothers, he always said he wanted to be a, a physician and a caregiver and when he was diagnosed shortly after that when they saw him struggling uh, during the early uh, couple of years that he was uh, dealing with type one, uh, and remember, this would be 39 years ago that he was diagnosed. Uh, they actually asked Joe, because he still wanted to be a physician, if that was, it would be okay, everyone would still love him and care about him and respect him, if he changed his career goals because of the challenges that he had at that point, just dealing with his diabetes. But Joe decided in his heart that he could only live one way, and that was to be a physician and to be a caregiver. And it wasn't that he had to be a physician to be a caregiver, because so many of you and so many people are caregivers without having a title of such or having gone through professional school or training to be it, but you care because it's in your heart and in your soul and in the fabric of who you are. And that's who Joe was. Joe was a person who actually didn't have children but had bunny rabbits and uh, if you'd go to his house uh, he had i never knew bunny rabbits could grow so big or that they were so special but um, they had their own bedroom and uh, they had their own names and they had birthdays and they had parties and celebrations but joe celebrated everyone and if you were in a room with joe and he was caring for you you absolutely knew that he was caring for you and I knew that as somebody who had the privilege of working with him, that he absolutely cared for me and cared about more than just what happened in the office, but what happened in life. And most importantly, he stood by his patients as he stood by everyone, his family, his sister, his brothers, his partner, uh, and by the people who he worked with. And most of all, Joe stood by his patients and he believed that he could make a difference in other people's life by what he did and what he chose to challenge, and he did. But the fact that Joe is not with us isn't Joe's fault. And it's actually not the fault of him not caring for himself, it's not the fault of an error, it's not the fault of anything other than that Joe developed type one diabetes before he went through puberty. Joe suffered from something that most of us you know, don't talk about. And that's uh, a sudden, capricious event that happens because he had type 1 diabetes. He didn't choose to have it. He chose every way to not have this happen, but still it did uh, occur. And, you know, he's probably still actually caring for his bunny rabbits up there and for other people in his heart, and I know that his sister and his family, who have been part of the entire uh, process of Joe's life while he was around, and Joe's life afterwards, Joe 
actually was buried back in western Pennsylvania where he served as an altar boy uh, and taught a Sunday school in the lo his local community church. Uh, they're extremely happy that you would choose uh, tonight to start off something that's so important to everyone in terms of how we approach our life and then we approach the challenges because clearly every one of us has challenges uh, that we have to go through uh, to pass through this existence. So on behalf of Joe and his family and his patients and everyone that had the ability to come in contact with him and most of all the bunny rabbits, thank you for honoring Joe. Thank you, Dr. Marcus, and let me, on behalf of our entire organization, express our condolences for your loss and the loss that we all feel as a result of Joe's passing. Now I'd like to introduce our first speaker. It's um, Dr. Stephen Edelman. I'm going to read the second one first. He is a professor of medicine in the Division of Endocrinology, Diabetes, and Metabolism at the University of California in San Diego and the Veterans Affairs Healthcare System of San Diego. He is also the director of the Diabetes Care Clinic of the VA Medical Center. Dr. Edelman has strong interest in education and patient advocacy. He is the founder and director of Taking Control of Your Diabetes, TCOYD, a not-for-profit organization with the goal of teaching and motivation motivating patients in diabetes self-care. With that, I'd like to welcome Dr. Adam. Thank you. Okay, well, <clears throat> I think I'm gonna put this on so I can walk around. I'm, I'm not sure if many of you know this, but um, I was the fellowship director at UCSD for 10 years, and so I was one of Joseph's mentors while he was there for two years. So I worked very closely with him for two years, and I got to know him probably as well as anybody, maybe not Alan, because he worked with him for so long. And Alan, I don't know if you know this, I referred him to work with him. Everyone else told him, don't join Alan's <laughs> He said, well, Alan's at Medtronic for these. I said, okay, it's safe. Uh, I've got to turn it on first. Okay. Okay, between my Omnipod controller, my G4, and Yeah, I don't, well, I don't know if you, thank you, Linda. Could you make the front lights a little uh, softer? So um, when I was first asked to come here, I actually, we, we just had to take in control of your diabetes conference in Boston. And we repeated the type one track we did in San Diego, October 27th. And I know at least uh, a couple of you, any of you have been to the, we're at the TCOID this year in San Diego. I know a couple of you were. But we have a type one track and we had a whole hour long lecture on this topic. And I can just tell you that um, I'm going to be sharing with you some information that I got permission from the family members of a few of my patients who passed away, like Joe. Um, and I, I'd say that the upbeat thing is, uh, these were days, you'll see the dates, before CGM. Now, I, I would say that, see, we all know that continuous glucose monitoring is not 100%, but it sure adds a big layer of safety. And I have not heard of anybody I, and I'm sure it probably happened, but I just not heard of anybody <coughs> passing away from hypoawareness, the old dead in bed syndrome, as us doctors crudely call it, um, who had a continuous glucose monitor. I'm going to show you a case where they had a blinded CGM. And that's why I don't use blinded CGM at all, because I, I think it's malpractice, if you ask me, um, especially in type 1s. Uh, so I put this talk together that actually could be for. Uh, caregivers, but as Alan said, we are all caregivers in a way. And let me just go through um, the presentations. And we have plenty of time for questions. And I'm kind of a good, I'm kind of
kind of good to set up uh, Dr. Polonsky. So this is uh, Cindy Keenan. She, she was a really vibrant person. To get on the cover of Diabetes Forecast, you, you can't be regular, you can't be a schlep, you know, you gotta be pretty high up there. <laughs> she was a belly dancer and a dental hygienist, and then she eventually got her CDE. Uh, there's a picture of her at one of our TCOID conferences. She was kind of our head volunteer down there. Man, she had more energy than anybody I know. And, um, and here's a picture of her uh, January 1st, um, just a few months before she passed away. Now, she passed away, I believe, in 2005. And she's, she was 51. She had type 1 for a zillion years. And she had hypo one awareness. She had a couple car accidents. And we, you know, we spent a long, I spent a long time talking with her about you've got to really kind of loosen up your control. Her A1Cs were less than six. Ever since she was diagnosed, people said, hey, you, you're going to go blind if you don't get your blood sugars down. You're going to end up on dialysis. You're going to end up with an amputation. And so she, she really did want that. She always said to me, I don't, I'm not going to get any complications. But she had some, uh, you know, she, she did have several seizures, paramedic visits. She got divorced, was living alone, and then one day her neighbor did not notice her grapes were up, her blinds, and so they called paramedics and, and basically she had passed overnight. And she, she was divorced, so she lived alone. She tested her blood sugar you know, 14 times a day. Uh, and she was just about to enter a study uh, where we were using low-dose glucagon at night in a separate pump to prevent hypoglycemia but um, not too much to cause high blood sugar. And I'm going to show you some of that data. Um, so basically, um, she passed away in 2005. And here are some of her, some of her history. She was diagnosed with type 1 at 19. Um, she, her parents uh, and, and the parents and herself was extremely educated about diabetes, very fearful of complications. She wore an insulin pump test her blood sugar, probably more than that on some days. She had several episodes of severe hypoglycemia. And I remember uh, giving a lecture in San Francisco and I got a call from the emergency room at uh, uh, San Marcos or Tri-City. And um, I, I, I couldn't answer it. I called back and then the ER doctor just says to me, yeah, we have your patient, Cindy Fina. I said, oh yeah, what's wrong? He goes, she's dead. Mm -hmm. Oh man, I, I, I'll, I'll never forget that. Um, uh, her A1C values were below six, despite, you know, urging by myself and others that she's got it back up. But you know, think about it. For 50 years, you know, 40 years, she's been at that level. It's just not that easy to back off. Um, yeah. And then I, I basically told you what happened to her. Um, here's another patient, uh, Jorge Rosenthal, and I did get permission uh, from the parents to share it with you. But just to make a long story short, he was a he, he was a great guy, he was a county executive, um, and he died at the age of 33. Um, and, you know, there's part of the paper. Uh, but he basically died of hypo He lived alone, and one day his parents uh, called him, and he didn't answer, and they went over, and he had passed. And I had gone back to my notes for Jorge, as well as Cindy, and I must have written ten times every three months, patient needs to relax their control a little bit because there's some data to show that if you let your blood sugars run a little bit higher that you can get back some of your unawareness and then uh, Bill Polonsky does hypoglycemia unawareness training centers but uh, programs but um, when you've had type 1 a long time you can you lose your counter regulatory response and I'll get into that but look, let's look at some of his characteristics diagnosed with type 1 at age 6 uh, so he passed away at age 33 um, his parents and the patient were extremely educated about diabetes and fearful of complications. Uh, he wore an insulin pump, tested his blood sugar six to ten times a day. Uh, several episodes of hypoglycemia, including a car accident. Um, luckily, no one was injured. Um, the A1C value was below six, and despite urging by myself and others uh, to let himself run a little higher. You can see it. I was about to say it's, it's almost the same slide, but I needed to change that. Because you didn't have a sex change. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 took, I walked with him at the JDRF walk in San Diego with his parents, and that was kind of nice. Big family, they had pictures of him. Uh, he lived alone. 
Um, and as I said, he, he didn't respond to calls from his parents. Now, I thought I would give you a little physiology lesson, um, but basically, in, in the normal non-diabetic state, we've got two slides, wow, that's good. But I only can point on one, shoot, okay. Uh, the, the pancreas secretes, has a lot of functions, it's not just insulin, but you've all heard of the beta cell, it secretes insulin and amylin, and then there's the alpha cells in the pancreas, they secrete glucagon. It's a very important trio, because amylin and, and insulin work to keep the blood sugars down, glucagon works to prevent the blood sugars from getting too low, and the other key factor is it gets right into the bloodstream. It goes right past the liver and into the systemic circulation. So it's like getting IV. You've all, hopefully if you haven't all needed an IV, but most of you probably had, but you give insulin intravenously, it works really fast, and it gets out of your system. And when we give insulin subcutaneously, whether it's through your pump or uh, a pen, it just acts too slow and it's too unpredictable. And I think the, the, biggest, the biggest feedback I get from patients who get onto the, the G4, they say, gosh, all of a sudden my fast acting insulin is not acting very fast. I said, well, that's the way it's been ever since you started taking it. And I think we can look forward to not only uh, better insulins that, that mimic rapid on, rapid off, and that leads to less hypoglycemia, but also the development of glucagon. And I like this slide because it really says it all. This was a publication by a friend of mine, <coughs> excuse me, Reza Levitans, who um, in the olden days when they had only blinded CGMS, this is data from nine subjects with a pretty darn good A1C. I wish my A1C was less than seven most of the time. It's not. You know, I, I shoot for low sevens because that's just about as best as I can get. Um, but these are patients with an average A1C of 6.7. Look at the bounce. No, these, this is blinded CGM, so they, they can't react to the number. I, when I talk to uh, professionals who are not diabetes specialists and not familiar with type 1s, um, I say this, this, is the, this picture paints a thousand words. It's the unpredictable swings that I think all of us have. How many people here have type 1? Raise your hand. Okay. How many people have type 2? That's good, because I please please leave the room. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, okay. This is the uh, this is the study I was telling you about. And I, I just can't believe this. They took a patient with type one who had hyper one awareness, they put on a blinded CGM, and then the patient died while he was in the study. And they're so proud of themselves. A confirmation of hypoglycemia the dead and bed syndrome. If you put dead and bed syndrome in Google, you'll get a whole bunch of stuff, and that's what uh, the Brits called it, and that's what basically happened to everybody tonight who we talked about, including Joe. And, um, he, they, and it, it was never documented before. And once again, uh, I, I've never heard of anybody passing away on a real-time CDF. So that's that's kind of good news. Um, and he passed away. So I mean. You know, most of the time when, we, when, we, when people with type 1 pass away at night, it's most likely due to hypoglycemia. And if your blood sugar gets really low and you have heart problems, let's say you're older, you can precipitate a, a really serious, what we call cardiac dysrhythmia, and your heart fibrillates, and then you can pass away from that. But it's, it's stimulated by low blood sugar. Um, I'm going to end with a positive note today. It's going to be hard, but I will. Now, uh, when you look at normal glucose homeostasis, you know, which is the big medical phrase, when your blood sugar goes up, the beta cell releases insulin, and it also releases amylin, uh, even though it's not on the slide, and it, and it, stimu it stimulates glucose uptake into your tissues, which is basically the, the skeletal muscle, the fat, and the liver. And if your blood sugar is dropping, insulin turns off, and the alpha cells release glucagon. Um, and glucagon stimulates your liver to produce glucose. And so everything's totally coordinated in a non-diabetic person. That's why, you know, they could eat a hot fudge sundae, they can eat two hot fudge sundaes, they can eat three hot fudge sundaes, and their blood sugars won't even go above 140. Those son of a bitch. <laughs> 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 I love the guys, by the way. <laughs> Be a little more direct. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
So uh, normally, you know, when you go to medical school, you, you learn all this stuff. But this is this slide's pretty interesting. That when your blood, when a non-diabetic blood sugar gets low, it's not just glucagon. It's a whole host of hormones. Uh, you've all heard of the fight or flight hormones, epinephrine. It's the same thing we, we call it in the lay sense adrenaline. Your sympathetic nervous system goes into play. Growth hormone is actually another hormone that gets released when you get low. Growth hormone is a hormone that raises the blood sugar as well. Uh, and cortisol, which is steroids. So for people who do not have diabetes, that's why they can actually fast and run a marathon and they will not get too low because they have all these counter regulatory and their, their insulin shuts off almost 100% but not completely. And a lot of these hormones up here, specifically glucagon, stimulates the liver to produce glucose. And, um, and what this means down here is the mechanisms are redundant. It means that these multiple hormones and mechanisms like the liver producing glucose are all overlapping. You know, to mimic the normal state is pretty tough. The human body is pretty sophisticated, uh, and is, is, you know, we try to we try to mimic what happens in the non-diabetic state by giving injections of insulin um, uh, several times a day. It doesn't even come close, and that's why there's so much bounce. Um, so what happens in type one diabetes? After five years of diabetes, you lose your glucagon response to hyperglycemia. So that means that when you used to feel, this is on an average, not everybody. When you, you know, when you first get diabetes, you might feel shaky, sweaty at 60, 65. And then after five years, you may not feel it till 50, 55. And then there's other hormones that go into play. And then for the worst case scenario, your first symptom is having a seizure or passing out. And those are the folks who are candidates to get, um, at least before CGM, those little dogs that are trained to pick up hypoglycemia, and that's actually one of the indications for a, a pancreas transplant. I have a couple of patients who had hypoglycemic disorder so bad they had to, if they wanted to work and go through life somewhat normal, they had to hire someone to just be with them, a human. Uh, and, then, and then they would just one person I know went to uh, Minneapolis and got a, a pancreas transplant. And here's the other thing: inappropriate secretion of glucagon after meals. Now that's that's a ripoff because it's not there to save you when you get low, but it's there in excess after eating. So uh, the regulation of glucagon in type one is totally messed up, uh, and the threshold for release is influenced by the degree of glycemic control. And once again, there is information to show that if you can loosen your control, you might get some of your symptoms back from hypoglycemia. Uh, and it's been shown time and time again that. If you have a bad hypoglycemic reaction, it impairs you even more, and it increases your risk for another severe hypoglycemic reaction. Can you so what? Back? Yep. Sorry. Yeah. That's all right. Thanks for taking notes. Um, okay. Now I'm going to show you a little bit of the information. Thank you. What's that? Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Uh, okay. Here's here's a study that I was involved with. <coughs> where we looked at glucagon levels in patients with type 1 of long duration. And um, this is the study that Cindy Fina was about to start. Uh, but let me just show you the average age was 46. Here's the important part. The average, average duration of diabetes was 27 years. Uh, you had to have diabetes at least 10 years to get in the study, and one person had, the oldest was 39 years. I met, I met someone here tonight who's had diabetes, oh, 55 years. She was looking pretty hot, too. <laughs> um, her A1C, uh, the average A1C was pretty good. I mean, that's, that's I'm, you know, anybody that gets less than seven, you know, the first question I ask, are you getting too many lows? So here's the study. Now, in this particular study, they were testing out very low dose glucagon given in a pump, separate from the insulin. Now, everybody got it in these different doses, two, four, you know, in part of these studies, you try to figure out the best dose that doesn't cause hyperglycemia. Um, and this group right here, I want you to look at in black, the triangles. These are the folks that um, didn't have anything, it was just placebo in their pump. And you can see that this is a, a glucose clamp study where we measured, you know, we had strange measurements, but I'm going to show you this, this next slide, which we measured the percentage of time less than 70 between 10 at night and 7 in the morning. This was a 
of study in a clinical research center. So you can see the folks that had pretty good A1C, a long duration of diabetes, they were below 70, 16% of that time. They didn't wake up or anything. Now, we did have a threshold. You know, we used CGM, um, and, uh, you know, if they got below 50, we would wake them up and give them something to eat. How, how many people attended that? Uh, well, there was six people, uh, but there was there were six people in the demographics I showed you, but we ended up doing the study multiple times. So it was probably ended up to be 20, 30 people. Un unfortunately, the company uh, didn't raise enough money to continue, but there's a lot of research on glucagon. I mean, uh, as part of the artificial pancreas, um, I, I can't wait till they come out with a glucagon pen that gives it to you in lower doses, so so you don't have to eat a bunch of stuff when you get it all. You can just give yourself a quick injection. Um, that'll be nice. It'll work faster too. So that's basically. Um, I think the most important part was to show you that in the fasting state, if you've had diabetes a long time, glucagon isn't there to save you. Now the other thing I told you about inappropriate after meals. This slide is a doctor's slide. It, shows hepatic glucose output, meaning your liver inappropriately pumping out glucose after eating. The meal is right here, as you can see. This is type two, but let's just look over here. This is, this is hepatic glucose production totally inappropriate. The last thing you want after a meal is, is glucagon and, and to stimulate your liver to produce too much glucose. And these folks happen to be on insulin down here. Um, oh, I'm sorry, those are people without diabetes. Sorry, I think I, yeah. Right, so this is, this is normal individuals. These are people with type one. And then this slide shows the actual glucagon levels, which probably led to the hepatic glucose production. And you can see in type one, you see an inappropriate rise of glucagon after eating. And these folks had type one on average over 10 years. And then here's when you treat those same folks with similar. So, um, it, it, so once again, the basic message is it's not there in the fasting state to save you from a low, but it's there inappropriately after eating. So, so these are some of the risk factors after reviewing 10 publications. Uh, people have a low A1C, usually less than 6. Um, they have, there's factors interfering with counter-regulation, uh, prior hypoglycemia, alcohol, uh, and certain blood pressure pills called beta blockers like metoprolol or atenolol. Um, and then you have autonomic neuropathy, um, and that's usually um, from long-term diabetes as well. Um, exercise, advanced age. Any, now that I'm 57, anybody over 80 is, is in that category. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, people who are very sensitive to insulin, changes in drug metabolism, and obviously if you don't eat enough. Uh, and once again, that prior episode of severe hypoglycemia puts you at greater risk. Prior, and, when do you mean? That day, that What's that? What do you mean by prior death? Like, uh, not that day. Just in the recent past, if you had a severe or you required a glucagon injection, mm -hmm. or, I don't think I, I don't think anybody knows the time frame. But have, have you ever had dead in bed where they've never ever required a glucagon before? Like never had a. a it's it's rare. Yeah. It's rare because it, it's usually it, it usually is a. I mean, it's yeah, I've never heard of that. It's usually someone with a history, of, which is why they were getting put on a CGM. Um, and at, out of those 10 articles, not one mentioned psychological issues. Um, and this is a gentleman that Bill's going to talk about. It, probably one of the most unusual cases I've ever seen. This email is from one of my fellows who, know, who knew Joe well, Nalina Chu. She said, hi, Steve. This is from an email. I need, and this is recent. I need your help. In fact, Matt, Matt Bestley knows him as well, too. Uh, with the case of a 22-year-old type 1 who is scared of any glucose value above 150. He is worried about any amount of hyperglycemia will lead to complications, reinforced by his minister at the Rock Church in uh, San Diego, who had type 1. Uh, he gives himself large amounts of insulin and easily gets hypo. His wife calls 911, honestly, two times a week. And she was about to have a nervous breakdown, and she was also going to divorce him. I know, I know two other divorces from uh, partners of people with type 1 who got low a lot. Um, he has lost two jobs. He was a school teacher, and he, he passed out while, while he was teaching class. And then he was a substitute teacher, and he did the same thing again. His A.O.C. is 5. 
He eats very little for fear of raising his blood sugar. And I can't see that, but he's pretty skinny. He's been seeing Dr. Polonsky and Dr. Guzman at the BDI just recently. Um, and then she writes, if I call DMV, I'm afraid he will stop seeing me. Because as a doctor, you're, you're almost obliged to call and report someone. Um, and you don't want to take someone's license away. You just want them to tell you when they're driving so you can stay off the road. Um, <laughs> and he has said to me, you are not a diabetic. And she's not. So you don't understand. Uh, do you think you could see him quickly? Uh, I remember when Matt Besson was working for Dexcom. Uh, Matt told me when he, we got him to Dexcom. You know, I, I think uh, our organization paid for the first one. Um, and the first thing he said was, I remember you telling me this, Matt. Oh, good, I can tell when my blood sugar is getting too high. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and, and Bill will talk more about the psychological issues. This is a, a slide to remind me to tell you that people are so afraid of complications. I went to Rwanda recently on a humanitarian mission, and uh, it's pretty sad there for the type 1s. And believe it or not, there's, you can get type 1 there from malnutrition. It stimulates the autoimmune system. I should say it stimulates the immune system. So there's a ton of type 1s in Africa. <coughs> And they get one shot of NPH in regular day, no testing, no testing supplies, no urine testing supplies. They get one blood test a month. There's no refrigerators. They keep them in little, little bowls of water. So don't complain. <laughs> but I would like to blow up my managed care company. Um, so this is this is an education. This is an education poster. This is this is supposed to be. Uh, you know, motivating for some of these people. So, yeah, look, look, at, look at that X over the, over the groin here. That was, that, was, that was motivating me big time. So, when you, when you look at all these patients together, you know, there's a long duration of diabetes. Patients are extremely educated. Um, and that maybe, you know, I don't know, that's not part of the problem, but they're fearful of complications. They typically are testing their blood sugars a ton. Um, um, and I put here, I've not, I've already mentioned, I haven't seen a death on a CGM device in real time. Uh, several prior episodes of severe hypoglycemia. Um, A1C values typically extremely low.